Hi, Tiffany. Hi. Um, today I'm with Tiffany, and of course, as usual, I'm going to start us off with a very juicy question. Mm. So we can get right into it, and then I'll tell you more about who Tiffany is. Um, Tiffany, I noticed that you have had some really good guest post opportunities. Um, mm. And I think that, like, a lot of us creatives um, are kind of nervous about that side of marketing. Um, I think it feels a little less creative, a little less whimsical, um, a little stodgier even, and we get kind of nervous about it. Um, and I wanted to know if you had any tips, not just for securing those spots, but actually for then handling the job of writing the post. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think for securing the spots, what I what I did, you know, two of my bigger kind of regular guest post gigs, I contribute twice a month on Paper and Stitch, um, and I've been writing for Brittany for two years now, um, which is crazy, but I, I love writing for her. Um, and then I also did a six-month guest posting stint on Design for Mankind um, while Erin was on her maternity leave. Um, and for both of those, I just responded to a call for guest posters. So for Brittany, um, she, I saw on Twitter that she was looking for guest posters and um, looking for contributors, and she's looking for business writers. And I, at the time, did not. I I did some business coaching, but I didn't consider myself like a business writer. Um, and I just went for it anyway, you know, and <laughs> followed the guidelines. I think that's one thing. If you're looking for, if you're looking to pitch a blogger who's looking for contributors. Follow their contributor guidelines. Yes. yes. Um, that's actually, I think, really, really key. And I think that I actually wrote a post about this on Paper and Stitch about how to how to respond to things like that, how to email strangers. I could try and dig it up and link it at the bottom of the yeah, video. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, was a, that was a post that I felt very strongly about because I feel like we – it's it's really delicate to email people that you don't know, but it's actually pretty easy. Like there are some things that you can do to make it way easier on your easier on yourself, and also to increase your response rate. Um, mm -hmm. So I did that, and it Brittany was like, "Great, let's do it." And um, awesome. Awesome. we've been having so much fun. And for Aaron, uh, you know, Design for Mankind is more of like a lifestyle design blogger blog, mm -hmm. and I'm a life and business coach. So I. Um, I wasn't really sure that one. T that one took a little bit more thought. So, because mm -hmm. she was looking for ideas, and I had met her, I knew Erin already, which was uh, helpful to already know her. Mm -hmm. So, I um, put together, I pitched her like a life design one hundred and one column that was about applying design principles to living your life. Um, and she wrote me back and said, "That's great. I'd love to see." I'd love to see a post. So I then like mocked up a post for her kind of in her style using, using things that she already had incorporated into her blog. So I think that's another great tip is that, yes, you want to still be yourself and you want to still write from the heart. But if somebody writes, someone only publishes pretty short, very graphic blog posts and you pitch them a 2,000 word essay it's probably not going to fit, right? So know your audience, know who you're pitching um, mm -hmm. is really key. And then in terms of how I write them, like how I just get it done, I don't know what I always do. There's a lot of time <laughs> for guest posts and also my own blog where I think, I don't have anything to write about, I don't have anything to say. Um, I think the key for me is I'm always thinking about it. Like I'm, I'm kind of a thinker and so I'm always, I have like these little slips of paper all over my office that are ideas that I'll like write down ideas or write them on a business card or, you know, make a note and I'll email, I email stuff to myself a lot from my phone. Um, so I'm just always thinking and I try to apply my own real life experiences to what I write. So pretty much every blog post that I've ever written has been precipitated by something that Either I've experienced, I've realized about myself, a client has experienced some something that has happened yeah, that yeah. kind of makes me think like, oh, I should write about that. So okay, okay. don't discount your, your life, right? I mean, I think that's where for creative people and for artists, like our lives are really, really great material for a blog post. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I got caught in my throat. <laughs> so I wanted to let everybody know who you are. 
Um, today I'm here with Tiffany Han, and it's Han, right? Not Han. It's Han. Yeah, it's I've Han. always pronounced it Han, but I thought hmm, yeah. I should really check it out. And Tiffany is a life and business coach for very creative people who aren't quite living their very creative lives yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love Tiffany if you told us more from from your perspective of what you do. Yeah, so I help. Um, I mean, pretty much that's it, right? Highly creative women. I always like to say highly creative women who want to have more fun mm -hmm. um, and who want to wake up happy. And I think that there is a... Don't we all? Don't we all, right? <laughs> I think that there is a pull, especially when you're, when you're a creative person, that often you live your life according to someone else's checklist. And um, Ooh, yeah. it, it can feel very constrained, right? Like mm -hmm. I wake up and I go to my job and it's a very respectful job. And I sit at my den, I do all the things and... And, and and what I find is that the people who I help kind of come to me and they're like, yeah, at the end of the day, I feel lost and I'm not happy. And I know that I'm doing the things I should be doing, but I'm not really feeling the love. So what I help people do is kind of figure out what needs to happen in their lives to get them to that happy place. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. For a lot of people, it's starting a creative business, um, kind of making, starting a business, doing something artistic or creative sometimes it's mm -hmm. kind of coachy stuff um, but I also work with a lot of people who already have creative businesses who um, maybe they've said yes all their lives to get their business to a place where it's successful and yet they're really miserable they're really yeah. unhappy oh, with the day to day um, and yeah. so I kind of help them reconcile that because my, my whole philosophy is if you have a creative business that you don't love you might as well just go get a job because it's going to be a whole lot easier. <laughs> and you're yeah. probably going to make more money. So Yeah, both yeah. of those are true. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Um, so I asked another interviewee a few weeks ago the same question. But I really think that you're going to have something interesting to say. So I'm going to ask the same question to you, okay. even though I usually don't repeat questions. Um, so artists, who are the people that, that I work with, um, they often have a lot of trouble leaving the emotions um, of their personal life at the door when they go into their professional life. Um, they are constantly, not constantly, but they're very often blending their personal and professional lives. Um, and because emotions from their personal lives are often kind of crucial um, when they're making art in their professional life, um, they have a really hard time. You know, the separation is, is really hard for them. Um, do you have any tips for separating the two, or do you think it's actually okay for them to intermingle? Have you experienced that yourself? I think it's absolutely okay for them to intermingle. I think that that's like part of being an artist is is that you are emotional and you are a feeler and you're sensitive. And and I think when I say intermingle, you know, it's one thing that yes, you want to maintain a level of professionalism. So don't flake on deadlines because you have PMS, right? And don't. <laughs> Don't be late from like don't be that mm -hmm. flaky artist because <laughs> it is your job and it is your business and it is your mm -hmm. career. But at the same time, don't try to be a robot. Mm -hmm. um, don't try to give people what they want. I think when I first started coaching, I did that a lot. I was trying to be like that coach that was like, oh, this is what I do, and and try to like blend in with all the other coaches out there. And for me, what I realized in my business was. When things really started taking off for me, it was when I really embraced my personality and who I was in all aspects of my business. So in my marketing, in my writing, in my even my my dealings with my clients, um, you know, that's people, if you're an artist, they want to interact with your work, but you're creating the work, so they want to interact with you. So if you turn it off, it, it's there's going to be a disconnect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes so sense. I say... Go, Go for it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't turn that off. I love it. That's great because I think that, yeah, it, it's really hard for, for us. And I think that um, we feel somehow like society pressures us to do it, to keep things really. Absolutely. You know, it does. Cold. Yeah. And yeah. So I love that you're giving us permission to just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, awesome. So can you tell me, since you work with a lot of people who are just starting their businesses, can you tell me what are like three-ish important things that you need to do like right off the bat? Yeah, let's see. Three. Let me think about that for a minute. Um, Take your time. <laughs> I think, 
I, I mean, for me, the biggest thing is that you start doing the work. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you want to be a painter, then paint, right? Don't spend all your time trying to figure out how to grow a newsletter list and be on Twitter and do, and this, because there's all that stuff is out there, right? Mm -hmm. And, and if you want to be a painter, get in the studio and paint. If you want to be a writer, start writing. If you want to be a coach, start talking to people, start getting in front of people, start working with people. The rest of it, you'll figure out, right? Because there are mm -hmm. people, like, I could say, oh, you should figure out social media and you should figure out your brand and all that. But, like, we get, where we get stuck, I think, is artistically finding our voice and letting, letting ourselves go through the really uncomfortable phase mm -hmm. of, like, make, you know, they say, like, make a hundred bad paintings and then you'll be a good painter, right? Yeah. So nobody yeah. ever wants to make those hundred bad paintings. No, we don't. Really comfortable. <laughs> so instead, they spend all their time on Facebook and on blogs and that, like, learn taking e courses and learning all the things in the marketing. Mm -hmm. I say just go, go start, go start making, go start talking about it. Trip over your words. Figure out what, how you want to talk about what you do, and and the way to do that is, yeah, you can like practice your elevator pitch till you're blue in the face. But practicing in front of a mirror and practicing in front of actual human beings is very different. Um, so I don't know if that's three things, but like yeah, that's it's fine. Yeah, that's what I would say. Is like yeah. I always, and you know, if it and if you want to be a blog, like if you want blogging to be part of what you do, that's another thing I hear from a lot of creative people is they want they want to blog, but they don't know how to start. They don't know what their blog should be called and where to go with it. Just start writing. Yeah. Because that's how you're going to develop your voice. This is really brilliant. Um, this is not advice that, that is typically given. Um, if somebody <laughs> asked me this question, I would be like, um, okay, um, target market. Like, I'd be fumbling for, like, the three most important things. Um, and so I really love that this is kind of, like, at the real heart of it, the real brilliance of starting your business yeah. is to just start doing what you need to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's really good advice because I, um, actually a lot of people, I was talking with somebody the other day um, who said she'd always dreamt of being um, a painter, actually, and the, an oil painter, and that she hadn't painted in like six years or something like that, <laughs> something insane. Um, and she was just like, you know, I kind of like just don't know how to get to the point where I'm an oil painter. And I was like, you know, you need to start thinking about who you're talking to and who you want to, who will like your work and yada yada. And then she realized just what you said that like she needed to get in the studio again. And it's kind of funny that you brought this up because I hadn't even thought of it like that. But that really did solve her problem. Like she she came back to me and was like, I got in the studio and I painted and I feel fantastic. And it's like, oh. yeah, there's something where I feel like we 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 wait for the world to give us permission. You know, it's like, oh, when you have 5,000 Twitter followers, then you'll be a professional <laughs> artist. And, and you know, I say, like, we can claim that for ourselves. So that if you, yeah. if I want to call myself a writer, but I'm not sitting in my chair writing every day, then I'm not a writer. Yeah. And, and if you, and I, so I think that there's a, like, just go do the work. You'll figure, yes, there are some, like, business fundamentals that are important mm -hmm. to having a successful business, whether it's creative or not, period. There are fundamentals. That stuff is all available, right? Mm -hmm. It's available through coaches, through education, through courses, yeah. through Google. Like, all of that stuff is out there, but but we, we get stuck where I see a lot of people get stuck is in that, like, but I don't know enough. Mm -hmm. And I say yeah. if you know how to hold a paintbrush or a pen or you know how to type or you know how to, like, mm -hmm. crochet, then you know what you need to know to get started. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And just get started, and the rest is going to kind of come along the way. You'll figure it out when you need to know it. Because mm -hmm. you'll get to the point where you've got 800 paintings in your studio, and you're like, holy crap, I need someone to buy some of these because I, <laughs> because I can't paint anymore because there are so many paintings. Well, that's a really great time then to figure out how to sell your paintings. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I ran out of paint and don't have money to buy more. Also exactly. Really time. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You're... Your situation will tell you when it's time to, to move on to the next yeah, step. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, let's see what else I wanted to talk about. Notes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So speaking of target market that I was just mentioning as one of the important things that I would have said, um, I think that we tend to, we as um, people who help creatives with their businesses, 
um, we, we tend to think of um, target market as kind of like this Hail Mary, like, solves all the problems thing. You know, oh, just figure out your target market and everything falls into place. Um, do you think that that's true? That that, when, do you see that happening? That once people figure out their target market, their businesses sort of all kind of make sense? Um, I think target market is a starting place. So I think, I think, yes, I think figuring out who wants your product is really important, but then I think you have to let them know about it, right? Like that's the next piece. And I always say there's like a kind of a Venn diagram that I use with my clients. So it's, it's people who know about your product, who want your product and who can afford your product, mm -hmm. right? So there's those like, like your friends and family might know about your product and might be able to afford your product, but they may not be the people who are like, I need this, you know, anatomical mm -hmm. heart artwork in my kitchen, <laughs> right? Like, they may not necessarily get it. So finding yeah. those, like, the people who get it, who have the money to buy it, and who, um... Can afford it. And who, no, and who know about it, right? Yeah. Letting them know about it. So I think, yes, figuring out who your people are is step one. Step two is telling them about it a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, they say in marketing that it takes seven touches before... Yeah people respond and and I think that's where people get really caught up is they know their target market they might even have the followers they might even have that community support but they get really shy that oh I don't I don't want to bother people like I hear that so much and what I say is if if they're your target if they are truly your target market they want to hear from you yeah they are not going to be bothered because they have asked for you to tell them what you're up to because mm -hmm. they are excited about it because they they care and so tell like shout it from the rooftops and and I think that's where if we go back to the question about your personality and your emotions get emotional about it like use you can use your own personal story as a marketing tool yeah I think that's totally true and we like I don't know what it is about marketing. We like totally turn ourselves off when we go to hit like the marketing typing. We're like, okay, I need to write a sales page or a tweet about my new product. And it's like suddenly we're cold and like callous and like these, you know, hyper professional individuals that like, I don't know. It just, it's like we turn corporate when we go to write about our products and go to yeah. like market things. Yeah. Sales pages are, and I have to say like, I don't like writing sales pages either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's really not fun. But I think Alexandra Franzen, um, who I adore, and she's amazing. And so any yeah. creative people who don't know about her need to know about her because she completely reframes the writing process, I think. She writes um, amazing sales pages, if you can even call them that. <laughs> yeah, and, and she has a post. She has a post somewhere. I'm sure you can find it. Where her thing is like write a sales page like it's a love letter, mm -hmm. yep. And I think that's such brilliant advice because it's it's yeah. so different than like write a sales page so strangers on the internet will give you money. <laughs> then it's like oh that sounds so hard. Yes, you know it sounds but hard and it sounds sleazy. It makes you feel like ugh. Yes, yeah. but if you can think about selling and marketing as I have something really amazing to offer the world. I'm just making sure they know about it. You know, how, how many times have you been disappointed that you find out something was on sale or you find out this thing was available that you read about later and you're like, oh. I would have loved that, yeah. I would have loved that. You know, I just found these, like, glitter boots on the Internet that I was like, I was like, so, I, they're still available. I'm going to get a pair. But I was, like, so sad because I thought they were, like, years old and then I wouldn't be able to get a pair. And I was like, why didn't anybody tell me? You should have told me about the glitter boots. Exactly. <laughs> and, like, that's the feeling that you yes. want to try to avoid. Like, that's mm -hmm. why you write sales pages. That's why you tell – that's why you market. It's so that you can let people who really, really want your your stuff, whose life – like, and I do. I mean, I think artists, like – I think artists change lives with their work. I don't, I don't think mm -hmm. it's just about mm -hmm. I put paint on a canvas and you you give me money for it. Like, it's, it's that you – allow someone to bring beauty into their home mm -hmm. and there is emotion in that and there is an emotional attachment and these and people walk by that i mean especially when it is the type of art that you put in your home they walk by it like every day and they're constantly mm -hmm. seeing this and it does it makes them think about their world and their life and it brings beauty and that's i mean it's very soulful and i think yeah. that we tend to think of our work as just like not important <laughs> yeah i think we're yeah, trained so to do it society's you know ripped us off here 
It has. And and so I say, like, who are we to deny the world mm -hmm. of what we what is beautiful and amazing? And and mm -hmm. it, there's a you know, I mean, easier said than done because there's a confidence in that and a security in your work and a trust. But if if you can find that, if you can find the confidence and the security and the trust, it's gonna make the marketing, it's gonna make the sales pages, it's gonna make the target market and the brand, like all of that will fall into place. So mm -hmm. so like start there, right? And then we go back to doing the work. Make the hundred crappy paintings. Mm -hmm. By the hundred and first, you're gonna look at it and go, Well, that's not half bad. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> And sometimes a lot sooner. So, like, don't be exactly. so daunted by a hundred paintings. Exactly. Sometimes it happens exactly. after, like, five or six, and you're like, whoa, I have a or good painting. Or it might painting. happen after the first one, you yeah. know? Or you might look at five or six, and there might be something in every single one that you incorporate into number seven that you're like, that's, that's, that's my voice. I found yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Um, and I want to note here about, um, about letting people know about you. Um, that I find this happens, and I'm going to speak to one particular kind of person right now, I find that this happens to musicians a lot, okay? So, like, I can't tell you how many concerts I have been like, that happened last weekend? Are you kidding? I would have been there. I would have given them my money, no problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would have been at that concert. And it's always, like, you find out after the fact. Um, and so definitely, like, big shout out to musicians Please <laughs> tell yeah. people that you're having a concert. Like, people, tell people I've got my gig down at whatever restaurant, or you know, just let everyone know. I hear a lot from people about their newsletters. So they, and one thing that is one piece of advice that I say is like, if you are new, if you're starting out and you have a website, have a newsletter sign up. Yeah. I don't care if you have no idea how to write a newsletter or how to do anything. Figure out how to put a sign up on there because you want to start collecting information of people who want to hear from you. And yeah. then what people, what I hear from people is, oh, well, I don't want to bother people. And it's like they asked mm -hmm. for you to send them updates. They yeah. asked to hear from you. They, yeah. they gave, they willingly gave you their information and said, please email me once a month. Yeah. So do it, right? Like yeah. that's, it's, we, we make up so many stories in our heads about mm -hmm. what the rest of the world wants. And I say, let's I mean, just... And the fact is, is that we're with ourselves all the time. And so we're hearing ourselves talk about this next event or this next product we're coming out with or whatever. And we're like, oh my God, I'm talking about this so much. We send one email to our newsletter list. They're only hearing about it the one time. Nobody's going to be upset with that. They're like, no. dude, I wanted to hear about this. <laughs> and if they are it. upset with it, they're not your target market. Oh, yeah. Right? So like... That was, I think, one of the best things I ever did for my business was stop getting emailed when someone unsubscribes from my mm -hmm. newsletter. Um, I just don't even, you know, I go in and check like every so often now just to see if there's anything trending or anything, but I, I don't worry about it because I figure if I send an email and someone unsubscribes, okay, that's fine. I mean, I unsubscribe from emails all the time. We all get way too much email, oh, yeah. right? And so that's, like, don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. another... I mean, there's no reason to be talking to the wrong people. They're never going to buy anyway. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. They're just taking up space. But I will say it is emotionally awkward and hard for you to see somebody say, like, basically say straight to you, I don't really want to hear from you anymore. So it's okay to feel like that, that slight yeah. negative, like, ooh, they unsubscribed. Yeah. But then get over it. <laughs> well, or or shield yourself from it. I mean, that's the other mm -hmm. thing is if, like, like I said, like, I used to get an email every single time someone unsubscribed. That's and I used to get an email every time someone subscribed, right? So I'd feel that, like, yes, oh. <gasps> yeah, that's You know, it's like, mm -hmm. turn those off. <laughs> and and you start to, like, that's the other thing is the longer you do it, you start to develop a resilience to it. Mm -hmm. Where you think, oh, okay, whatever. It's just not, it's not actually that big of a deal. Because you're focusing on doing the work. Mm -hmm. You're focusing on making art. You're focusing on all of that. You're not, you're not letting your number of newsletter subscribers dictate the success of your mm -hmm. business. And I think that's where, where all of these people that are shouting at us, how to increase your list size, how to, like, blah, 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 right? That's, that's what everyone is telling us is the key to being successful in business. When, when without a really solid product, mm -hmm. your list size doesn't matter. It all starts right there. You're right. It all starts with what you're, what you're producing. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so I wanted to know if you have um, a team in your business, or is it just you? Um, I kind of have a team. So it's mm -hmm. me, and I work with um, this fantastic uh, woman named Erin Cassidy, and she is my blog manager. And so mm -hmm. um, she helps me. She helps me with all of my blog graphics um, because I. I realized a while ago, like I really wanted to kind of do more, um, more things that are were graphically impactful, you know, and try to kind of tap into Pinterest and all that and, mm -hmm. and be able to do more with that. And what I was finding was that I was putting off writing my blog post because I hated making the graphics. So, um, That's awful. yeah, I know. And I was like, <laughs> this is ridiculous. So I've been working with Erin. I started working with her in March of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, and she is like the best thing that I could have ever done for my business. I adore her. She's so fun. Um, we're making a 2014 calendar together that mm -hmm. is going to be, I'm like so excited about, um, and I'm really hoping it, like I'm hoping people, I'm hoping people respond as well to it as she and I have, because it's something that she and I are both really stoked about. Mm -hmm. Um, so she helps me a lot. She also is is really great for me to work with because she she's the kind of person that I want to work with. She's the kind of client that I want to work with, and so it's great for me to be able to bounce ideas off her. We have a phone mm -hmm. call. We talk twice a month, um, and it's just really great to be able for me to say like, "Here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? How would this work?" Um, and do I have any other people? Not really. I mean, I have, like, I have a web designer who I'm working on updating my website right now. Um, and they're great. They're they're handling all that. I think for me, like, I used to try to do it all by myself. And I recognize that there are things that I'm not so good at, like graphic design or website coding. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yes. And so I, I'm kind of, you know, outsourcing that. Um, I have a bookkeeper who mm -hmm. set me up in QuickBooks and kind of over like reviews my stuff every now and then my accounting. Um, but otherwise I do everything else. Now, even though I do everything else, I also use like an automatic calendar system for my clients. I do all my billing through PayPal. So there is some stuff that some systems that I have set up that I oversee but that helped me out with my business too yeah that makes sense um yeah. and you find that that's like helpful to free you up yeah <laughs> it's helpful to free me up but it also keeps me from like like for me to hire someone to code my website where for me coding like doing something that involves code and like some crazy web thing could take two or three full days where I could just pay someone some money and they could take care of it. So it frees me up both time-wise, but also energetically. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's not that weight of like, oh, I have to do this. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, like for hiring Aaron to do my, my blog, like that was something that I didn't even realize at the time, but it's really having her visually able to help me so consistently has really helped me develop my, my visual brand. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't even know, I didn't even think that that was going to be something that happened, but it's just over time kind of been one of the things that's come of it. And my web traffic's gone up, my Pinterest traffic, like everything has gone up exponentially since I've been working with her. So it's more than just, it's more than just graphic design. It's, it's kind of this bigger picture to my business. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think that the energy is kind of important there. Um, well, especially right now because you're pregnant. Um, right. And so that kind of makes a big difference. Um, yeah. But in general, too, I mean, I think that when we when we feed negative energy into our world because we're doing tasks that we're not really meant to do, um, it tends to drag us and make us unable to do even the work that we like. Yeah. I mean, it just sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And again, why, you know, I, I mean, yes, there will always be things in business that we don't want to do. But mm -hmm. for the most part, I say, like, if you can outsource that as much as possible, while, mm -hmm. but outsourcing in the right way, right? Like, I, Erin and I have very similar aesthetic. We have, like, she totally gets my message. She totally gets my brand. And I trust mm -hmm. her completely. It would be different if I outsourced my design to somebody who didn't have any emotion and, or, you know, who wasn't emotionally connected to my business. Mm -hmm. So they didn't identify with creative people. 
exactly. it'd be out the window awful. Exactly, and it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So I think I think outsourcing, but also outsourcing to the right people is really mm -hmm. important too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I know that you've got a webinar coming up on saying no, and actually by the time that this airs, it probably will have already happened. <laughs> yeah, but I'm gonna, I'm just, it'll be a, I'm going to offer it as a a standalone product after. Excellent. So, so I'll probably link to that below. Um, so on saying no, I wanted to know if you've ever, I mean, I'm sure you have, or you wouldn't be doing a webinar about it, um, but if you felt caught up in, in business so much that you feel like you don't have time to even savor your regular life. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Like that's been the last two years. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and I find for me, it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, and part of it is I love working on my business. I love working. I love doing the things that I do. And, and, um, you know, my family and friends are very supportive of my business. So it's just kind of the thing like, Oh, Tiffany's working. Like that's what she does. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's very easy to get caught up in saying yes to things that don't pay you. And by pay you, I mean not necessarily financially, but when we talk about energetically. Mm -hmm. um, so that you just become, like, I, I have this happen a lot where I'll look at my to-do list and realize every single item on it has a name attached to it. So I've got to get this person this thing and this person this thing. And, you know, and it's not, it's not necessarily things that are serving me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, same goes for Facebook usage and internet usage, right? Like all of that, like, how is it serving you? I keep a post-it on my computer that says, how is this serving you? It's just oh, kind of a reminder you. of like, you don't need to spend all your time in front of the computer. I think that we, I, and I realized a while ago that I still had my remnants of the corporate job where I felt like I had to clock my desk time. So it'd be like 4.30 on a Friday afternoon and I'd be like watching YouTube videos being like, when is it going to be 5 o'clock? And it's like, oh, my God, I'm at home. <laughs> Just get up. That's hysterical. <laughs> um, now that I'm pregnant, it's a lot easier to say no just because I literally have less available time mm -hmm. to do things. Um, but I I think that we – it shouldn't take, you know, an, a, a life-altering act to <laughs> – to bring that, like, we should, I think boundaries are really important. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to recognize, right, being able to say no to things so that you can say yes to the really exciting things. I mean, yeah. that's what we're really, what I really want is for people to, you know, leave room in their closet, their virtual closet, for the really great clothes. Yeah. Even though they don't have them yet. And you, and you hear that a lot, but I think it's really true. Um, I think that you hear it and you just think, yeah, 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 you know. But when you actually get down to it, if you're so busy doing all this other stuff, you aren't, not only are you not going to have time for the other things, but you're not even open to it, like, like subconsciously. You know, you're yeah. kind of not even leaving yourself open to, to even receiving opportunities that are better and more awesome for you. you yeah. Know? There's a feng shui principle called, like, the empty shelf principle. Um, and what they say is that in every room of your house, which <laughs> obviously <laughs> I don't have right now, <laughs> in every room of your house you should have an empty shelf or an empty drawer. Um, and what that does is, is it sends a message to the universe that you're ready to receive. You're ready for something new to come in to mm -hmm. that. Um, and I, that's what I kind of tell myself with my schedule, too. And I think when you're first starting out, downtime is really scary because you don't know what to do with it. And so mm -hmm. you fill it up, you know, yeah. and, and there's and also think it means this that you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. You know? It's like, Oh, if I'm not working in like 24 seven, then I must not be working exactly. hard enough and I'm never going to make it. And I'm going right, to Right. Right. And you want to say yes to opportunity. Like that's the other thing is people say at the beginning, don't turn down opportunities. And I, I think absolutely don't turn down the right opportunities, but don't just do work for the sake of doing work. Right? Don't yeah. just spin your wheels because for creative people too, we don't, we, we tend to discount how much downtime we need. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, that's when, when earlier when I said, like, I'm kind of always thinking about blog posts and thinking about what I want to write about. That's my whole life. So if I'm out walking my dog or at the park for the afternoon, theoretically I'm working because my brain doesn't ever stop. You know, yeah. I mean, I, often pull my car over on the side of the road to write down an idea. So give yourself that credit, like, like give yourself that space and give yourself credit that even when you're not working, like sitting on typing on the computer, you're working, you're mm -hmm. running your business because your business is part of who you are. 
Now, when you're trying to decide what opportunities to say yes and no to, do you personally rely on your instinct or do you have like a process that you go through, like where you ask yourself some questions about the opportunity and what it means for you? Yeah, I mean, I pretty much rely on my instinct. I think if it's if it's a cool, if it sounds cool and sounds fun, um, then I usually will say yes to it, depending on how much time I have. I mean, yeah. that's that's a big piece is, is these days I'm pretty much saying no to anything that's non-essential mm -hmm. because I have three less hours in my work day every day because I have to feed and take a nap, yeah. you know, feed myself <laughs> a lot more than take a nap. So, um, these days I'm kind of categorically saying no to most things. Um, yeah. you know, I also, I also mostly say yes to things that are, have to do with people I know. Um, you know, that's kind of going back to that emailing strangers thing. If you want to write for a blog, if you want to get to know someone, reach out to them on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Start getting to know them before you need to ask them for something. Because mm -hmm. it's... I get I get asked a lot of things from strangers, and they're, they, they make it really easy to say no. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but, like, if you if you want to reach out to a stranger and you want them to participate in something or collaborate with you, make it easy for them to say yes. Make it easy for them. You know, make it something where they're like, "Oh my God, you sound great. Of course I'll talk to you. Of course I'll help you out. Of course I'll write this blog post or whatever." Um, and and I think energetically, like I've been able to tell because I've because I've said yes to so many things that maybe didn't end up being worth it. Mm -hmm. I learned every single time, like, oh, next time this happens, I'm saying no. Yeah. Um, and it makes it a lot easier down the road. It's the hard thing is when it's saying no to clients, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's one thing if it's blog posts or doing work for free or things that are going to mm -hmm. take up time, but it's when people want to work with you that you know that you're not energetically a good fit. Mm -hmm. That's when That's it's really tough. challenging. That's that really is tough. really tough. Um, yeah. I've had to do that before. I had to basically fire a client. Who I had, like, I was at the stage of the game where I didn't know who my clients were yet. So when I got in there with her, it was like, whoa, this is not right. And it was kind of shocking. And I had to tell her, like, and of course, I went about it the wrong way. And I upped my prices to a way that she couldn't afford, which is not exactly the most direct, honest, best way to go about it. But what I should have done was talk to her in person and said, you know, I think we're not a good fit. Here's where I think you would be a better fit. You know, direct her to a better right. place for her yeah. yeah because when it's not a good fit for you it's not a good fit for them either <laughs> no it's not yeah and I think that's where with the personal with the kind of work that we do recognizing that not everyone is your person mm -hmm. is really really key yeah you know? and, and both in your clients and customers and also in who you collaborate with and who absolutely. you spend time with in that kind of level of things yes. yeah absolutely not I always say like you don't we don't no one has time to be friends with everybody mm-hmm and I think that there is oh, that when you're starting. my soul, but it's so true. <laughs> yeah, and I think when you're starting out, you like want every, I want everyone to love what I'm doing. I want mm -hmm. everyone to know. I want everyone, right? Everyone I mean, it's it's so <laughs> you know, and and I think about my like internet friends who I love and adore, and I love and adore them. But I don't. It's like how much more room in our lives? We don't have room in our lives for 1,200 friends or mm -hmm. 2,000 friends or like all the. And, mm -hmm. and I think just kind of accepting that and saying, like, it's okay. The people who need to know about me will know about me, and I trust mm -hmm. that. Um, there's a surrender there, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, I think that is all the questions that I wanted to get to, and we are right on time a little bit after. So, great. Um, so, Tiffany, where can we find you online? Yeah, so you can find me on my website, on my blog. It's uh, just TiffanyHan.com. It's T I F F N. Put it on the video. <laughs> H A N dot com. Um, I'm on Twitter. Everything. My Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest are all um, at the Tiffany Han. So T H E Tiffany Han. Um, man. <laughs> yeah. So I'm pretty. I'm pretty easy to find, and I would love it if you guys. Um, Reach out, say hi after the interview. If, you, if anyone has any follow-up questions for me, let me know. Twitter is a really great way to reach me. So um, you can tweet me questions, and I will be very happy to answer them. And I will go ahead and put all of that information below the video. So if you're watching right now, you can see it down there. Um, right. Hopefully I've put it everywhere on, like, YouTube and everything, too. So 
good news. Well, thank you so much. For thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. And answering all my questions. And it was awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Talk soon. <laughs>